Right. Good morning. My name's Steve. I'm the director of BirdLife over in Malta. Very, before I start, a very quick question. Has anybody here been to Malta? Okay, a few of you. Okay. Another question, and, and I'll try and explain why I'm asking this. Can you tell me which side of the road do the Maltese drive on? First of all, do they drive on the right? No. No. They drive on the left? Yes. Yes. Okay. When I first came to Malta, a friend of mine who's the godfather of our organisation, a guy called Joe Sultana, the best ornithologist I've ever met, said, no, Steve, Maltese people, they drive in the shade. And I didn't understand what that, meant, what that meant for a long time. But I think this, port, this, this situation will explain what that really means, which is Maltese people like to take the easy route. They like to take things in a kind of Mediterranean, kind of relaxed kind of way. And when that happens, unfortunately, it causes problems. It causes big environmental problems on Malta. And I work on, obviously, bird migration there. But if you go to Malta... Uh, there's a lot of other environmental problems because of this unfortunate let's take the easy route, let's keep, try to keep everybody happy. And in the process, nobody's happy. OK, so let's talk a little bit about Malta. I'll try and make sure if I can get this thing to work. OK, Malta, tiny, 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 tiny island in the Mediterranean Sea. Always been very strategically important. The Knights of the Templar, the sort of weird sort of things, they occupied Malta for hundreds of years. They were the people that did the Crusades. There's weird books written by that weird bloke about them. But they occupied the islands because of its strategic location. And then the, the, the country that's apparently the cause of all the problems in Malta, the Brits, that's me, um, also occupied the islands for a very long time because right in the middle of the Mediterranean, it's a very strategic location for shipping and for trade. So it's always been very strategic. It's very strategic for birds as well. So from the point of view of birds, travelling between Africa and Europe uh, twice a year, for me, Malta's like the middle of the egg timer. Now, I know purist conservationists will say, what's he talking about with these migration routes? But literally, birds in the springtime are coming from all over Africa, going up this central Mediterranean flyway, mainly through Italy, but we've seen ospreys coming up and going to Sardinia and Corsica. We've got booted eagles that come up through Malta, head over to Montenegro. So this flyway thing, although, yes, most of the birds follow the central route, it's much more dispersed than ever we ever realise. Now, why would they go to tiny Malta? Well, when the re weather's bad and they're trying to get to Sicily from, from Tunisia and Libya, the weather's bad, the wind's blowing in the wrong direction, they get exhausted, they see a spot of land, and they head for Malta. And as a result, during the migration time, we see an incredible diversity of birds coming over the island. My favourite's the bee eater, not something you see much in the UK, my house in the countryside, you see clouds of these birds flying over your house, and it's just quite amazing. Um, the other amazing thing is hundreds of herons, hundreds of herons, thousands of herons sometimes, all flying through the Mediterranean. Weather's getting bad, and they land on Malta, and they kind of, they kind of rest there. The thing that perhaps we're most known for for what we work on are raptors. We get loads of different sorts of raptors, birds of prey, flying through Malta, um, and roosting at night time when it's getting cold and they can't get to Sicily in the springtime. One of the things that's happened just recently, which is just, just bizarre, was a huge flock of white storks, many of them from a conservation project in northern Italy, couldn't get to, again, couldn't get to Africa coming the other way, ended up roosting on the only golf course in Malta, the only place in, in, the, in September that's actually green because they water the grass there, nowhere else is like that. And it was just quite bizarre seeing these storks on a golf course with loads of expat Brits going, my goodness, what have we got on our golf course today? <laughs> and the thing that causes most of the, the, the controversy, birds like the turtle dove, the birds that have been traditionally hunted by the Maltese, come over in very large flocks. And unfortunately, when these birds get to Malta, there are 10,000 hunters out there waiting, literally waiting to kill them. Now, 10,000 hunters might not sound like a lot of people, but Malta is, like, is basically like Bristol dumped onto the Isle of Wight. So it's a tiny island, 26 miles long, the densest concentration of hunters in the world. I mean, I live in the country. I go for a walk at this time of the year with my dogs on a lead, and there's hunters here, there, everywhere, shooting over my head. There's trappers trapping finches that won't let me go for a walk on, on the land that I'm allowed to because, obviously, I might disturb them. So... The countryside in Malta is occupied by hunters, and they occupy it not just to get birds, but to stop me and other Maltese people enjoying the countryside. You just don't want to go to the countryside when the hunting season is on. You probably want to go to a shopping mall because it's actually less stressful than being in the countryside, and I'm not joking about that. Now, what's the impact of all these hunters? I think we have a, a short clip here. 
This is a beautiful black winged stilt, amazing birds. We get them nesting in small numbers on Malta. They're migrating all their way to places like Sardinia where you see hundreds of them in the, the wetlands there. This was shot by a young guy on a roof in, in Slima, which is one of the urban areas of Malta. It was migrating over, hunter shot it in the wing, bird had to go to the vets and had to be put down. And that happens all the time. This is what's happening with birds on Malta. Another example, which I think I clicked for this one, don't I? Oh, sorry, I'll go back. I think you need to help me with that one. Oh, do I do it? OK, oh, here we go. This is massacres of birds. So you don't believe massacres of birds happen in Malta? Yes, they do. This, oh. this was a flock of 50 booted eagles. They came from Montenegro, probably, on their way to Africa for the winter last autumn. 50 of them arrived on Malta in the afternoon. 18 got shot in that period of about two hours that we witnessed. We don't think any of those birds escaped from Malta. They all got shot. That could have been the entire population of booted eagles in one of the old Yugoslavian countries like Montenegro. So to say that the situation on Malta is not serious, which hunters often claim, is just not the case. It's pretty, pretty dire. And why is it so bad? What's the problem? Well, one of the main problems is there are 10,000 hunters and general elections on Malta can be swung by just 3,000 votes. So every time there's a general election, the hunters literally do point guns at the politicians' heads. This is the former prime minister. This is the new prime minister, Joseph Muscat. And on the eve of the general election, Joseph announced a deal with the hunting community. And ever since he's been elected, the controls and the restrictions on hunting in Malta have been rolled back. So instead of things getting better, which they very, very, very slowly have been, things are getting worse very, very quickly now. And that's because the hunters portray this lie, which if you, if you sign a deal with us, we'll get our people to vote for you. Luckily, I think the new prime minister is just beginning to see that that really isn't the truth. There were riots in Malta recently when he closed the hunting season. And the hunters rioted in, in Valletta, the capital, and they were insulting the Prime Minister, which you don't do in a country like Malta, and just saying, we will never vote Labour again. That cannot help but make a difference for this man, but will it happen in time? OK. The other issue, frankly, the European Union is useless. I'm a very strong Europhile, uh, but having worked now at the European level, this guy is likely to be the next European Commissioner for the Environment. He's a Maltese Labour politician. So he's behind and supportive of all of the rollback of hunting in Malta. It's very possible if he doesn't do his job properly and acts in the national interest, the disease of Malta could spread across the EU. So trying to work with the EU to get them to do their job is also impossible. So what we decided to do in BirdLife Malta, realising we had probably 10 years of Labour government in bed with the hunters, and an EU that will take eight years to do something that take, should take six months, is that we would go to the people of Malta. So we set up a campaign for a referendum so people could abolish spring hunting in Malta. Spring hunting is the worst because the birds are flying home to breed. If you're a conservationist or a hunter, you don't kill the goose that lays the egg. You kill it later. You don't kill it when it's about to breed. So the referendum campaign was launched because the people in Malta can abolish spring hunting. There is a law that enables us to have a referendum. If 50% turn out and vote and 50% plus one of those vote yes, spring hunting will stop overnight. So we thought, with probably 10 years of stalemate everywhere else, this was the only way to go. And I'm going to show a very short film, I think. Do I click again? <coughs> OK, maybe we won't show a short film. There's a film there? OK, sorry, was I getting a bit clicker happy? There's a very short film that shows what the, what the issues are here. With sound. With no sound. Birds migrate from Malta. They go to all over the world. Any luck? I can... OK, we're sound free. So this is basically saying turtle dove, which are one of the main hunted species, are coming through Malta. They're on their way to different parts of the world uh, uh, to, try, to try to breed in the springtime. So in the, in the winter, lots of them are going to Africa. The few that survive are coming back over Malta in the springtime. And when they get to Malta, because they're exhausted, unfortunately, these 10,000 hunters, oh my god, there's 10,000 hunters are there waiting to shoot them out of the sky. And once again, when you witness this for the first time, uh, the, the British High Commissioner for Malta used to be uh, in Afghanistan. He said, what you witness on Malta is, n is worse than anything I ever witnessed in Afghanistan, the intensity of what's going on there. So they shoot all these poor birds, big piles of them in the countryside, poor little turtle dove going, oh my goodness me, what are we going to do about this? 
Well, the answer was to go for a referendum. Gosh, you speak so much faster when you're not trying to do the narrative in line with the thing, don't you? And one of the reasons why we focus on turtle dove is the huge decline in Europe that there's been. And the answer was for us, for the people. It has to be the people that make this decision. This is in the hands of the Maltese to decide. Europe won't decide. Interfering Brits like me won't decide. We've got to find a way for the Maltese to do it. And the answer was to try to raise some money, because basically this has got to be a political campaign. You've got to run this very much like you would like an election. So we needed sort of about €70,000 to get the money to do the political campaign. And this came at a time when Chris Packham got very interested in the situation in Malta. So kind of synchronicity, synergy, amazing things happen sometimes. Chris decided he was going to come over with Ruth and, and Jez and Luke, these amazing people, to just make some films about Malta. And I thought, this is a huge opportunity, but this carries huge risks because they're going to be independent. As an as a NGO director, it's quite hard kind of saying, oh, I need to let go of this and let them do what they're good at and just kind of ride it. That's, what ha that's actually what we did and what happened. And what we're going to do is have a quick clip from Chris, which, which will explain the kind of massacre on Malta side of, of what happened. And then we're going to go to Ruth, who's going to explain how we went about making these films with them acting completely independently and us going, OK, let's hope they get it right and uh, let's see what happens. Have we got the clip from Chris? Obviously, in a darkened room when this was filmed. Any luck? Should I do a little dance or pretend to mime a turtle dog or something? I could do that. Um, I'm really sorry that I can't be with you at the Communicate conference this year, but I'm very pleased that you've asked one of my colleagues to come and make a contribution. We were tremendously excited by our ability to communicate the problems that migratory birds face when they traverse Malta in the springtime. Now we'd thought uh, and tried to get a major broadcaster to cover this and we'd also tried to excite the NGOs to take a slightly more proactive stance. But in the end our simple frustration meant that we spent a few pounds out of our own pocket and four of us went to Malta and we decided to use social media to communicate our frustration and our anger and disappointment and concern about what we see as a very important issue. So the platforms that we used were YouTube and primarily Twitter. And it was tremendously successful. We had more than 25,000 hits on each of our YouTube films, which we attempted to post every night. Uh, during one of the weeks, uh, we had more than 3 million hits on the Twitter account that we were using. And it was picked up by all of the other media. All of the national newspapers picked up on the story. One of them, The Sun, even sent a photographer and a reporter out to Malta to cover it whilst we were there. Uh, I was able to speak to Breakfast News and uh, Daybreak on, on ITV and also the Today programme on Radio 4. So from a very humble objective, from four motivated individuals, using social media we were able to expand our opportunity to communicate over a much wider area than we ever imagined. And I think therefore this presents an opportunity to say to people, you don't need big budgets and you don't need expensive teams and, and all of those logistical costs, you can actually do things yourself. And that sort of empowerment I see as being an incredibly important tool for people with conservation and environmental concerns in the future. You've got a phone in your pocket, you've got a Twitter account, you can load something on YouTube, you can tell the whole world what you think is wrong with it. And if you do that in an intelligent and a proper way, then people, it seems, will listen. And now I think I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ruth PC, uh, a, a tremendous woman with a fantastic amount of energy, drive and ambition, and without whom this whole project wouldn't have been possible. So, Ruth, sock it to them and tell them what it was all about.
Morning. Thank you, Chris. You've just said in two minutes what I was hoping to eke out over 15, so uh, <laughs> better start again. Um, as Steve said, we went out there as a team of four. Um, Luke and Jez, who aren't here, fantastic cameramen, really passionate about this, and it really was teamwork. It was all four of us that did this, and I really just want to big them up as well because they were paramount to the, to the project. Um, I do work for the BBC Natural History Unit at the moment. I want to, to say that now and get it out there. This project was independent. As Chris said, we dug into our own pockets. We paid for this ourselves. We were not part of the BBC. However, as Chris also said, we did try to get this project off with the BBC and other broadcasters and indeed push it out through NGOs before that. In fact, I even managed to convince Natural World to send me on a recce. <laughs> and... Um, they said there wasn't a story out there, so my objective was to find a story, not a problem. I came back with the makings of an action movie. High-speed car chases, guns everywhere, dead birds falling out of the sky. So then they said, birds aren't sexy. I tried to tell them that the UK spends £200 million every year on birds. In the end, it was just a flat no. And it's frustrating because... There, well, there are many things that are frustrating, and had we been operating through the BBC, we would have had to have shown both sides of the argument and things, which, to me, is ridiculous. What's going on in Malta is immoral and it's illegal. Had I been covering a murder investigation, I wouldn't have been expected to show the murderers in the equal amount of light as the victim. And I think that it's wrong that had I covered it in the BBC, I would have had to have done that. However, it sounds like I'm really bitter and cross. And I'm, I'm genuinely not. I'm genuinely not. People think that big organisations have a responsibility to address issues like this. And yes, I agree, they do. But we all have a responsibility. If we believe in something, it's up to all of us to put it out there. It's not the responsibility of the big organisations. And we felt with this that we had to do something. And we wanted to do something that was different. So we used a different platform. And we made it in a new way and we engaged local people. And the result, I think, was far more powerful than had we gone through a bigger organisation. We were able to campaign. There's always an excuse not to do something, but sometimes you've just got to be brave, take a risk, and do whatever it takes to get the message out there. And this is exactly what we did. And I think this clip that we're about to show illustrates some of the risks that we took. It's a lovely sunny morning on Malta and I'm up here looking down on an area called Mazib Woods. It's a public place, anyone can walk there, but it's also one of the best pieces of habitat that I've seen since I've been here on Malta, the only tract of extensive woodland. The problem is that it's absolutely bristling with hunters. In some places they're no further than 20 metres apart and when you walk in there things can get a bit interesting. You're provocating me. I'm not. You are, you are provocating me. Are Stop shooting. You filming. are provocating me. He's Stop shooting. He's Stop he's shooting. Filming. He's filming me. Stop shooting. He's Don't filming. provoke. If you go back there. Don't provocate me. Don't provocate me. He is filming me. Don't provocate me. Don't provocate me. Don't provocate me. Stop shooting. He is filming me. This is a public place. Stop shooting, Eric. Stop shooting, Eric. You are provocating us. We you came not. here. Stop to shooting on him. No, okay. If you walked back to his side, you wouldn't be filming. Shooting. This is me. This is my. 
my nest and you stop here. It's so it's, so, it's empty, all right? It's empty. Go ahead, please. 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 Stop. No, stop. Sorry. Go ahead, making with the film. I'm not. Yeah, but if you're in there. Just no. But you can't stop here. Why you stop here? Why? This is a public place. No, you can't stop there. You can't stop there. Over there. Okay, you can't stop there. But look okay, here. Okay, move over there. It's empty, the gun, and okay? Look it. here. The gun is empty, all right? Okay. 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 Stop provocating us. Walk over there. there. Stop provocating us. They are filming me here no. in a public place. Get the hell out of here now. Get well, the hell out of here now. No, no, you can't. Get the hell out of here. We can be You're here. You're not in us. You're in our Get country. You're in our here. country. I'm not in your Wait. country. No, You're in our country. Move over there, please. No, Move over there, there, please. We can it's move over your property. It's it's no. Right. You are provocating me. But we're not provoking yes. you. We came up You are provocating me. Here in a Get the hell out of here, Move. Get the here. hell out of here. <laughs> All we were trying to do was go through a walk through a wood. And we'd spoken to people on the ground who wanted to take their dogs through that wood, but they didn't feel that it was safe. So we just wanted to show to people what it's like if you want to go through a walk in public ground. Anyway, that's what happened. But we didn't just use YouTube, we used Twitter. And we used it to show that we were just a group of individual, normal people giving everything we had to this. And we also used Twitter to get things out as they happened and engage and start conversations. We didn't have embargoes. We used everything as teasers for our films that went out every night. We built the attention of our audience. And as a result, we we, I can never say this, we trended on Twitter two nights in a row. And of course, yes, we had more impact with Chris than if we'd been four random people. He's a public figure. That means that what he was doing was of the public interest and therefore was in the news. His connections also enabled him to get space on TV and in the newspapers and on the radio before we left. And this only built when we were out there. Once again, we engaged with the press of all, uh, across all media platforms and encouraged them. And we didn't have any embargoes. So what you saw was what, what was happening. Um, so as filmmakers, we went on a journey with Chris and we took our audience with us using the immediacy of social, ne social media to allow them to be with us every step of the way. There was genuine jeopardy and this is what I believe kept people engaged. We had one evening where I was uploading one of our videos until 3am in the morning. I wasn't going to give up and go to sleep, I was exhausted. but. You don't give up because we've got a sense of duty to our audience. They believe in us and we've got to give it to them. You know, we've got to give them everything. Chris ended up in a police cell, but we still got a video out that night. Even if it, we put out a picture of him outside the police cell just before he went in and we put some voiceover to say what was happening and we made a promise to our audience that we would get the video out as soon as he was out of the police cell, which we kept. The fact that things didn't always go smoothly made the struggle feel real and helped members of the pu public relate to the, pu to the project, perhaps more than if it had been perfect. It was a genuine predicament. We were emotionally engaged and so was our audience. And I'm going to end on what for me is the most emotional part of our journey. With our final clip, please. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before we were back at the vets. Another bird had been brought in, a Montague's Harrier. Maybe one of those birds I'd been watching just this morning. It's a stunning, stunning bird, but it's got a really horrible injury. Oi, this looks really bad. Really, really bad. Yeah. When did they bring it to you? A couple of hours ago they picked it up, we rushed over, a bird life team and brought it straight here, which is... Uh, because this is really still bleeding. Yeah. And I can feel the fracture under my hand. So this bird is one of the 80% that just won't make it. So, if you put the bird in. This is not really a painful procedure. We know that it's 
a horror bird in. Soil or bird. So, so what I would like is if you could just hold the head a little bit. Yeah. I would move the abdomen here because I will come from here. How long does it uh, normally take? I mean, it's, I think he's already getting. Yes. I think he's now like anesthetized. <sighs> oh, God. Honestly, we've got to stop this. This is madness, absolute madness. Sorry, but it's just. Um, Be getting soft. <laughs> right, let me tell you something. This bird has just gone from being one of the most beautiful birds we've got in Europe, one of the rarest breeding birds in Britain, and now it's just become another statistic here on Malta. Let's make that statistic count, okay? Because being here is pretty bloody rubbish.